We are in, uh, again, we are in Perak Bet of Sefer Malachim Aleph. We're in the midst of a conversation that's been taking place around David HaMelech. David HaMelech in Perak Aleph, we are told, Bamelech David Zaken Baba Yamim. He was old, he was feeble, and then he was presented with the reality that Adoniah, his oldest remaining son, or the son who was the eldest of those who remained, was ready to take over and had declared himself king without permission. There was a plot between the Navi and Bathsheba to come to David, and at that point, David Amelech strengthened himself and returned to a position of leadership as opposed to this feeble old man. Uh, he then took the steps and had Shlomo Amelech and Shlomo anointed. Shlomo began to reign while David Amelech was still alive, but David was in his last and final days. And that's where we pick up Perak Bet. And in fact, Perak Bet begins precisely as those words, Vayikrivu yimei David lamut, Vayitzav et Shlomo b'no lemor. That David Amelech was close to the days of dying. Notice it doesn't say David Amelech though, it's only David. Because at this point, if you think about it, his son is already the king. So this is the person, David, who is close to, to dying. And David Amelech is 70 years old at this time. It's in his last yeah. final days. And he turns to his son, Shlomo. Now, according to Chazal, and Shlomo was, was all of 12 years old when he became king. He's identified as a nar virach, as a young lad who is still um, soft, in a sense. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't have the wisdom. We'll see. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have the strength. Uh, he has the abilities of what we would imagine a Shlomo HaMelech has. And David HaMelech's first statement was, I'm mortal. I'm going in the same way that all people are going. It's similar. We found similar terminologies with Yehoshua when the time came for him to die. And he says, I'm going the way of all the people of the land. And at the very same time, it's and you have to strengthen yourself and you have to be able to stand up for the position. You have to be a man. Now, literally in English, be a man is a similar concept like we have Vayita Laish. Typically, Vayita Laish, well, he, he is a man, but it means to be a man, to be a person of strength. In fact, Targum Yonatan says in the Pasuk, Gevar Dechil Chatim. Okay, you have to be a person who's fearful of sin. You have to be more than what you think you are. The, the Barbanel picks up as well that, the, that Shlomo was only 12, and what he's trying to do. He's trying to encourage him that he can do what's next and what's necessary. The first thing you need to do that you have to take care of is you have to take Bishamarta. You have to take care of, says the Malbim, the, the things between man and HaKodesh Baruch That's your first step. Lishmor chukotav, mitzvotav, umishpotav, ve'edotav. To observe all of the Torah. Now, on this, the mitzvot obviously describes each of these words as being significant. Chukim, we know what they are. Those are the mitzvot without explanation or without re reason that we understand. Mitzvotav are the mitzvot, are the commandments between man and God. Mishpatav are the commandments between man and man, like say, like like parshat mishpatim, we have ve'edotav. Those are the commandments which are edot, which talk about by doing this you are making a statement of something else. A classic example would be the one of Shabbat. When we when we observe Shabbat, we're testifying to the fact that God is the creator of the universe. All of those pieces you have to take care of. Katub Torah Moshe. Just like it's written in the Torah of Moshe, Leman Taskil et Kolasher Tasev et Kolasher Tif Nesham, in order that you will be able to understand what has to happen and where you have to go. Now, this is interestingly reason one you have to keep the mitzvot. Because Davin Amelech then goes one step further. He says, Leman Yakim Hashem et Varo Asher Diber Alai Lemor. 
And also, this is a prerequisite so that God will fulfill what he had said. In other words, the purpose is not just for you to be a good Jew, but the purpose as well is to make sure that we have an eternal monarchy where he'd said, Im yishmeru vanechet arkan, where God had told David HaMelech that if the Jews go ahead and they observe the approach, their, their paths, lalechet lefanai ve'emet, to walk before me in truth, bechol avavam bechol nafsham, with all their hearts, with all their souls, lemor lo yikaret l'cha ish me'al kisei Yisrael. Then HaKadosh Baruch Hu had promised David HaMelech that the monarchy would remain. The Malbim points out that even though we typically say, you know, you're not supposed to do a mitzvah in order to, uh, to get some kind of schar, the Malbim says at the very same time that this was part of the fulfillment of a nevuah. And David Amel says, this is what we need to do because this is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. Yafa, you had a question? Yes, I don't know how to get that raise my hand thing, so I'm raising my hand literally. Or you can just yell it out, it's fine. Okay, right. The, the, <laughs> one, the, the ending of the Pasuk Gimel, Lama and Taskil, it's Kol Asher Taseh, it's Kol Asher Tifnesham. It sounds like it's a benefit to you. You're going to be smart. You're going to be wise. Now it's, it's focusing on the your benefit part versus the Hashem require, saying, okay, now I'll do my end of the deal. You're right, the next but this is something we've seen before as well. In fact, we had uh, with Yehoshua, when Moshe Rabbeinu told him, or HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him, Rak chazak v'yamat ma'od l'shmur l'asod kol ha'tawal l'man t'askil b'chol ha'sher t'elech. the same terminology with Yehoshua as we have with the Shlomo. Yeah, Jim? Did someone else have a question? So it's not an unusual, it's following in paths and words that we've had before throughout Tanakh. But can I just ask you, what yeah. does it mean, Laman Taskil? What if you left all that part out? So, I mean, so it's formulaic, but the formula must have some real significance. Well, they, well, is that a bad question? I, I'm not really sure. No, I'm not really sure. I think what David Amalekh is telling him is that there is benefit to what you do. You do, you do have Kodesh Baruch Hu's commands, and you will be able to have the wisdom that you need. I'm not sure why that is so problematic. No, I'm saying, so it, uh, but to me, uh, coming from, a, you know, a, the Pasuk perspective, I'm thinking to myself, like, Torah is going to make you smart. If you follow all the chukim, the mishpatim, the chule, if you follow that, that's going to make you smart. Don't think that there's lack of wisdom and it's all well formulaic. There is a benefit that you can't know. Right. I think that's what the books are saying. Rabbi yeah. Mutanki? Yeah, Sam. This is Sam Kahan. What about using the word succeed for Taskil? I haven't seen that used in that sense. Do we have a do you have a basis for that, Sam? Uh, well Seichel always uh, works that way, but if you use Seichel you will succeed. I, I yeah, have to I'm look not, it up. Yeah, but it just, I, I, I in the context to say that Taskil would also be success. It's in the art scroll, Rabbi. What is Rabbi, it in the art scroll? Rabbi Matanki, I, I can point you. I, the art oh, yeah, the art scroll. The art scroll will right succeed. You will succeed. Yeah. And okay. the JPS says prosper. Hold on one moment. I'm getting the Targum right now. Let's look at the Targum. Um, the Tatzlach Yat Kol the Ta'avid. Tatzlach is that you will be successful. You are, you're correct. Okay, I appreciate it. But that says that too. Okay. Um, let's keep on going then. Pasuk hey. V'gama tayadata et asher asali yoav ben Tzuriah asher asali shnei sarei tzivot l'tzuriah l'avner ben ner v'lamasa ben yeter v'er again. Now, and it, it's Fascinating. Hal Halbertal in his piece says, um, is very critical. He says, David HaMelech starts out with the religious. Be, be from. And now, let's be realistic. So let's look at the different people who you have to be careful for. There is a machloket, by the way, exactly what is being asked of David HaMelech, uh, of Shlomo HaMelech at this time. It looks like, almost, that he, 
This is a very Machiavellian piece. Here are your enemies, take care of them. The Barbanel we're gonna see says, here are your enemies and um, be careful about them. Not take care of them, but be careful of them. The first one is Yoav ben Suri, and we've been watching Yoav and his role with David Amela throughout. Mm -hmm. There were two terrible crimes, but there were other times as well where Yoav tried to urge David to do things that David refused. And the re the Yoav was the protector of David. And exactly what his motivations were, I'll read to you a section in just a moment, but the first person that David tells Shlomo you have to be careful about is Yoav. Now Yoav had been the one who had supported Adonijah and his approach to be the king after David. So it's a pretty natural kind of warning that's taking place. And it says, so you should know what Asali Yoav and Suri, which Yoav did to me, okay? What he did was opposed. It wasn't just that he did to protect, he did it against him. The Ralbag says, listen, when he heard, when he killed Absalom, when he killed Absalom, it was against what David said. And David was very harsh with him afterwards. Rashi goes ahead and says that actually what he did to him is a step beyond. That Yoav had gone around and Yoav had shown all the other um, sorry, the, um, all the other people what David HaMelech had written in the secret missive regarding Uriah Chiti. That actually was something extra. But you know what he did to me. It was to me. And he did it with two people. He killed two people. Abner ben Ner and Amasa ben Yeter. Okay, if you remember, both of these people were in some way going to be um, rivals for the military leadership. He killed them both. And he placed the blood of war in the midst of peace. Yoav, when he killed Avner, who was the military leader of Ishbosheth, Amasa, he killed, who was the military leader of Avshalom. Okay, it wasn't in the midst of battle, says the Malvi. So he says, the main milchama b'shalom, which would be legitimate if it was in a war setting, but it was after the peace had already come about. And so he had mixed the two, the yitain, the main milchama b'chagorotav, and he literally put the blood of war into his belt, which, which, was with, which he had girded his loins with, and it was into the military belt, like nowadays you'd say into his holster, but also onto his feet. The Barbanel points out that actually he, what David Amelch is saying is that he was rejoicing, he was glorifying himself with these actions that he had done. He made it a public action. And in fact, Rashi says, this talks about the death of Amasa, if you remember, when Yoah put on his sword and he grabbed Amasa at that time to give him what a apparently to give him a kiss, and at the same time, he stabbed him. There is even opinions that suggest that what he literally did was, like, you know, like they used to do in World War II with the fighter pilots, that they would go ahead and put something on their planes, or they would put notches in a belt, or something, literally a notch in a belt. That's what he was doing after each of these murders. Halbertown has, I'm sorry, um, Alex Israel has a fascinating piece. He writes, um, and I'm just going to read it to you from his book. This is the new book that, that he came out with. Solomon's name, his identity, his generation is one of peace. Yoav, on the other hand, is a man of blood and war. He belongs to a different age. Yoav does not know how to end the war. He cannot recognize peace. He places the blood of war in peace. In other words, he cannot allow peace to be born. Violence is his method of solving problems. And so David Melech warns Shlomo about him. Deal with him wisely. And he won't be able to die a natural death. The Barbanel says that clearly, it doesn't say kill him. It doesn't say that, okay? He ultimately... If he should have said kill him, the big problem we have is if he was so terrible, why didn't David kill him? And we had dealt with it at the time that there was an element of perhaps political necessity, necessity to leave him alive. Sure. But if he really was uh, liable for the death penalty in the time of David Amelech, uh, David has no right yeah. to say, okay, Shlomo, you do it now. 
But most likely it was, according to the Abarbanel, that listen, he, he just won't be able to keep it together. Deal with him wisely, and this is not going to happen. The Radak says that actually, Vasita Kochmatecha means um, set him up. You know that he's going to blow it. Make sure, let him do it himself, but don't allow him to continue to do what he's doing. On the other hand, Shlomo HaMelech, David HaMelech goes now to believe Nei Barzilai, Hagiladi, regarding Barzilai. In Barzilai, we saw back in Shmuel Bet, Perak Yutet, Tasech Chesed, they were helped, they helped David. Na'ayuba Ochlei Shulchanecha, they should be at your table. Ochlei Shulchanecha was the very same thing that happened with Mephibosheth. He brought people, they were part of the royal table. Kichain Karvu Elai Bebarchim Nitnei Avshalom Achicha. They helped me when I was escaping from Avshalom. Bineim Cha, Shimi Ben Geira Haimini. Now let's talk about the next one. So, so far we have Yoav you have to take care of in one way. Bar, B'nai Barzillai, the sons of Barzillai, take care of in the other way. Now let's talk about Shimi ben Gera. Shimi ben Gera, according to the Gemara, was Shlomo HaMelech's Rebbe. Okay? And David was very, very concerned about that. And so he says, listen to me very carefully. When it comes to Shimi ben Gera ben Yiminili Bachurim, notice, Hinei Imacha, he's with you. Notice, he's your Rebbe, you have this relationship. And he was the one, when I was running away, he made sure to curse me. And then afterwards, when I'm coming back after the rebellion has been quashed, he comes down to the Jordan. I swore that I wouldn't kill him. Now, I have this problem about Shimi ben Gera. Ki ish chacham ata. Shlomo, you're a very smart man. Be'yadata tasher taselo. You know what needs to happen to him. Ve'horadata tsevato b'dam sh'o. And he is going to die a death before his time. Here already, if you notice the terminologies, ve'horadata tsevato b'dam sh'o, you will take him down with dam, with blood, is very different with the way he had described before with, with Yoav. Yoav, he had told him earlier uh, that There he said, be, deal with him wisely. He, don't let him die a natural death. Here he says he's going to be killed, the blood, which is the basis for where the Abarbanel can say there's a difference between the two. I, David, Rabbi, yeah, I don't understand. So here, there was this bad relationship with him and David, but he was Shimi Shlomo's. But he right. was Shlomo's was Rebbe. Rebbe. Isn't that bizarre? Uh, it is unusual, I would say. I'm not sure bizarre. Remember, there's so much intrigue that was going on. There are people who have the bad side and the good side. I, the only way I can understand it, and I agree with you totally, Alita, the way I always understood this is that Shimi ben Gera, when it came to political machinations, was, was, a, was a bad person. When it came to the question, however, of, um, of teaching, he was able to teach. I've been in some institutions which had machlokot, for example which have had disputes and, and uh, all sorts of different kinds of problems, or in English, machlokas. And it's amazing that you find brilliant people who are wonderful teachers who do crazy things when it comes to power. And you don't understand how they do it. So somehow, you know, David HaMelech had promised he was, nothing was going to happen to him. But he knew that when, David knew when he would be out of the picture, that Shimi ben Gera's aspirations, his, his political side may come to the fore and, or would come to the fore. And therefore he said, don't take any risks with it. Remember, Shimi's personality is also different. You think about Yoav, Yoav has been consistent throughout. Yoav, and I've referred to him in the past as the consigliari. You know, Yoav was the person, he did whatever needed to be done. Um, but he was always consistent. He wasn't warm and fuzzy. He felt he was protecting David 
And even when David got old, he felt he was protecting the monarchy. Okay, that's his goal. He, Alexander Haig, I'm in charge. Okay, that kind of piece. On the other hand, when it comes to Shimi ben Gera, Shimi ben Gera is an opportunist. He's cursing David when he's leaving. He has, by the way, he's from Binyamin. So remember that show. 11 o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, excuse me? Okay. He is from Sheva Binyamin. He has that side, remember, of the people who were loyalists to Shaul yeah. now, as a possibility. And then on top of it all, we see how he, mer mercurial in the sense, he can go from one moment cursing David to the next moment blessing him when he's coming back. So tell me what you got from uh, Wolf. That, that is a more difficult personality than you would normally imagine. And so as a result of that, that I think is where it plays out a little. Vaishkav David imavotav, vayikaver be'er David. David dies. Now, there is, you remember the famous Midrash. The Midrash is not written in the, in the Naf. It's one of those things that, you know, sometimes there are Midrashim out there which become so much a part of our understanding of Tanakh that you think they're in the Chumash, but there's that Midrash of David being told that he was going to die in Shabbat, and as a result, he would spend the entire Shabbat learning Torah, and he would never stop for even a moment, and finally the Malach Amavis didn't know how to get him because when he was learning, he couldn't be killed, and finally he made some noise outside, David Melech went to look at the noise, and that's when he died. Okay, but it, this is the point, David, he was buried in Ir David, this is a royal burial. Ir David, you know, we don't really know where he's buried precisely, the cover of David Melech is, uh, is definitely a place where it's possible that he may be buried, the one that they haven't, but the only problem is its location, it should be in Ir David and not in Arzion, but we don't know. Vayamim asher malach David al Yisrael. Now the, the period of time that David HaMelech actually reigned was Arbaim Shana, was 40 years. The Chevron malach sheva shanim, he ruled for seven years in, um, in, in Chevron. Shmuel Bet, we know it's actually seven and a half years. Uvi Yerushalayim malach shloshim v'shalosh shanim, and, he remained, and the remaining period of time, he was the king in Yerushalayim. The difference, again, between the two, the two periods of his monarchy, initially he was building the monarchy and he was staying with his own Shevet, with Shevet Yudah, in the south. When things finally got to the point that he was truly over all of the nation, he moved up to Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, again, being one of those cities which is in the middle of Binyamin, in the middle of Yehuda, and maybe in no one's Nachala whatsoever. Washington, D.C., by the way, was built on that same kind of model, that you create a capital city which doesn't necessarily belong to anyone, so no one claims for their state, or in our case, for their tribe, the Yerushalayim. There is another Medrash, obviously, that Binyamin and Yehuda had it split, and the Beit HaMikdash was split right down the middle between the two tribes. Ushlomo yashav al kisei David Aviv. And Shlomo now is the king. He's sitting on the royal throne of his father, Vatikon Malchuto Ma'od. And his monarchy is established. Now, what do you mean it's very established? The Ma'od Rashi says it's even Al Ha'el Yonim, that he was even a monarch over the celestial beings. It wasn't just on this earth, it was over the entire um, existence. <coughs> Exactly what Malchuto Ma'od means, and probably in the most literal of sense, is it wasn't like we will find later in, in Sefer Malachim, where people have an established monarchy, but uh oh, look out. But rather, his monarchy was there, and, it was, and his power base was there, and he was able to move forward. And we'll see that he doesn't have the pretenders to the throne like others have, and he's able to put down what's necessary, and that's the rest of this parak. Here comes Adoniyahu. Now, Adoniyahu had been saved from death by Shlomo. Shlomo had called him in at the end of the previous parak and said, listen, go home. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear from you, and you'll be fine. Adoniyahu now breaks that rule, and he goes directly to Batsheva, who is the mother, obviously, of, of Shlomo, Vatomer, has Shalom bo echa, Vatomer Shalom. The first question that Batsheva says, and she's worried, she says, are you here in peace? 
because we know Adoniyahu tried to kill, tried to put aside Shlomo and would have killed Shlomo. Okay, that was very clear from the statements that had happened before. He would have been killed. That's the normal, the normal process that occurs. But he didn't. He, he didn't get the chance because Shlomo became the king. He shows up at Batsheva's house. Batsheva says, are you coming in peace? She doesn't know what's happening in this case. That's the Abarbanel. She says, what's it all about? And this happens pretty soon after the death of David, according to the Abarbanel, within days. And so Adonai says to, to Shlomo's mother, I have something for you, from you. So tell me what you have to say. You know that I really should have been the king. And everyone was looking towards me to rule. Now, this seems to be a bit of an exaggeration, if you remember. There was a large number of people. I don't know who says it was everyone, but it's it, not without the realm of possibility. The people assumed this was going to be the case. And nevertheless, that monarchy that I should have had was moved around and it went to my brother. It was from God. And now. I'm asking one thing from you. Don't turn me away. I said, okay, speak. Tell the king, all the covet in the world, tell the king, that he should turn away your requests. He should give me Avishai to be my wife. Avishag Hashunamit, if you recall, okay, this is the woman who was brought in the beginning of the first parak to keep Shlomo to keep David Hamelach warm. We are. It's clear that there were no relations. It says it very clearly in that time. But she, he wants Avishag. Now the goal of this is real simple. Okay, we'll see. Now part of it is. He wants to have some property. He wants to inherit in some way. But the problem is what he's asking for is something that only goes to the next king. There's a simple situation, the Rambam Paskins is in Hilchot we know it, that whatever was the king's property goes to the next king and not to others. Whatever was the king's use. In fact, if you recall, during Absalom's rebellion, one of the first things that he did was he violated the Pilak Shot he violated the maidservants of David Amelech because that was his way of claiming power. We find this actually in a number of places. In fact, a very difficult and complicated story it goes back and say from Rashid with Ruben after the death of Rachel and Bilhah, exactly what it means. But something, again, he was trying to position himself, Ruben, in that case. And Ruben was cursed out with all of these things. Separate story, but it's very clear that by asking Avish, for Avishad, what he's saying is, what he's trying to do is get something that doesn't belong to him, but something that would give him legitimacy in the royal house and show question about Shlomo. The Malbim says that for some reason, Batsheva doesn't get it right away. And we'll see that in a minute. We'll see that it says, he asked for all of this, but Tomer Batsheva told, Batsheva said, okay, I'm going to speak to the king. Now, the fascinating thing, and this is a wonderful comment that I found, again, this is in Habertal's book. Habertal writes as follows. The interpreter of such an implausible ploy wonders what Adonia actually thought. Was he completely oblivious to the possibility that his request would ignite the suspicions of Solomon, a king who was naturally waiting for his rival to provide him a reason to remove him from the scene, he miscalculated again, and the slip-up will cost his life. What the, story revealed, the what the story reveals is the addictive nature of power, its blinding force and the heavy price it compels its obsessive seekers to pay. In other words, what Halbertal is saying is, look, Adonia wants power. He wants to still get back into his position as the king. 
he failed. Not only did he fail, the Navi just told us, that Shlomo HaMelech was hard best. He was king. No one was challenging him. And all of a sudden, within days, Adoniyahu comes and he starts up again. How is it possible that he starts up again? Doesn't he realize what's going to be? It's, it could be, you know, for us, it's simple. He should realize. He should know what's going to be. But the reality is, his problem is, it's this blinding power that he wants. You know, his power is blinding him from this choice. Whether or not, by the way, Batsheva knows what's going on is a bit of a question. Batsheva seems, according to the Malbim, she seems oblivious to it. Uh, Alex Israel actually suggests it may be that she was so smart, she knew what she was doing 100%, just as she had set up David HaMelech to make sure that he would um, anoint Shlomo to be the king, appoint and anoint Shlomo to be the king. It could be that Batsheva realizes this is the moment that she's going to go to her son and present this seemingly innocent request, knowing full well that that's the end of Adoniyahu, and her son will be there. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible that Batsheva still worries about uh, Doniyahu being a contender to her son's throne, his power, and mm -hmm. she thinks that this is pretty audacious, but maybe this will keep him quiet? It is totally, po it's totally possible. We don't know. In other words, interestingly, there are hints one way or the other. But given last Peric and the way she behaved, there's mm -hmm. an opening to think that maybe she's in on it. And remember, even in the last parak, when the Navi told her what to do, it wasn't her plan. It was the, the Navi giving her, telling her, giving her the text, you know, giving her the <coughs> what she should say. So it's possible to say that Batsheva was, was an innocent in all of this. She just wasn't as politically um, astute. It's also possible to say that she was totally politically astute, astute and what you're suggesting half is somewhere in the middle. And in fact, the next words, when she goes, Vetavo Vatsheva HaMelech Shlomo L'Daber Lo Al Adoniyahu, says the Malbim Lo is L'Tovato. That this is actually, she thinks that she's going according to the Malbim. And the Malbim, again, is of the position she had no clue what was going on here. She thinks, hey, this is a great idea. Yeah, for this could be the Tovat um, Shlomo. Hey, give him something small and he'll go away. But he already was away, which is the problem to say that. Rabbi Matanki. Yes. This is Sam Kahan. You don't have to uh, keep on introducing yourself. We know your voice. Oh, terrific. Uh, I'm not sure I can explain Batsheva, but I think you've covered all of them. But I think Adoniyahu's movement was he was trying to go to what he perceived to be the weak part of Shlomo's reign, his mother. And he, what he's doing is, he, she knows what he's doing, but he's doing it because he's saying, well, this is the mother. Here's a 12-year-old child. Uh, she's going to be more worried about him living as opposed to ruling. Right. And I think, Sam, I think that, that goes very well with what Yaffa had said per, earlier as well. She, going to Batsheva, there's no question. He is trying to be smart about it. Was, he's trying to figure out, mother asks instead of Adonia. You know, Adonia asks, wasn't supposed to show up in front of Shlomo. He had right. specific instructions. So he has to have some intermediary and find the mother. Could be 100%. I, we don't know for sure. There are all these possibilities out there. The Malbim says she's oblivious. It's possible she knew it fully, and it's possible she was calculating in a way to try to keep the peace, like you and both Yafa are suggesting. And he's sitting on his seat. And at the same time, he takes another, there's another chair, and he puts it on the side of, of, his, of, of his chair. There is a, you know, the pshat is that he had a seat for his mother right next to his throne. Now, according to Chazal as well, he is, at this point, he's already married at 12. And he already has, Rechavam was already a year old. Uh, according to this Medrash, Batsheva is sitting there next to him. According to that explanation. According to, however, on the other hand, what it does say is um, that Rashi quotes another Medrash and says the Eim HaMelech is the Ima Shel Malchut. Is that Ruth was still alive and Shlomo HaMelech had a seat alongside his for Ruth. 
that's definitely a midrash. Okay, the reason why um, it, it has room to to fit is vayasim kisei leim hamelech vateishav limino leim hamelech. Why isn't he saying about sheva? Why doesn't it say leimo? Why is it aim hamelech in that sense? In the third person, that's the midrash. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the midrash. It's a fascinating way we bring all things back together again, which is the nature of the midrash. But tovu sheila achat tana. Shows you have a question. Didn't you say that Oma Melech was 12 years old? Yes. So he's married with child at 12 years According old? According to the Midrash, the Rechavim is already one year old at this time. Yeah. Oh. But Tomer She'ela achat k'tana anochi sho'elet mitach. And so she says to the king, I have this small little request. Al teishevet panai, don't, don't turn me away. Vayomer la ha'melech. And so... Um, she says, Vayomer la ha'melech shalimi. So he says, ask me. Now notice, it doesn't say, Vayomer la bena. It doesn't say, Vayomer la shlomo. Vayomer la ha'melech. Now, interesting, why would it be that it says in this way, you know, it could be that Shlomo sitting on his throne, as much as his mother is his mother, he understands clearly his role as the monarch. And it's very different. It could be that Dr. Mikra, I think, goes in this approach, is that this is more because of what he's going to say, that the Navi who writes the Sefer is putting this in. This is, the ki- this is a king responding and not a son responding. I'm not going to turn you down. Anything you want. Now notice again, Batsheva says a small little thing. Now the small little thing fits in all three different approaches we're trying to take. She was oblivious. The Malbim, the Barbanel says that. She was calculating. You know, you say it's a little thing and it's a really big thing. It gets a charge out of somebody. You go ahead and you say it's a little thing. And, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure he goes along with you. So you say, call it a little thing. Vatomer, and she says, Yutan et avishag, hashunamit ladoniyachi chalisha. I got this great idea. Give avishag to Adoniyahu. Vayaan hamelech shlomo vayomer leimo. And now, shlomo hamelech responds and he says, Vayaan vayomer is a signon ram, is this powerful kind of response. Not just Vayomer. It's a double response here. And he's saying it to his mother, but he is Shlomo HaMelech. Why are you asking for her? You might as well give him everything. He's my older brother. All of this, they were all involved in it. This is a plot you're getting into the middle of. The Medrash actually, they, sorry, the Targum Yonatan actually picks it up. This was an etzah, this was a, an advice that all three of them must have been part of this plot. And so now Shlomo takes it over. This is the language of an oath that God should do thus to me and this, and he should do even more. Once upon a time, it used to say what ko was, what thus was. But by the time it comes to Shlomo HaMelech, this is like a classic terminology that introduces an oath. Ki benafshod diber Adoniyahu. Adoniyahu, what he just said is he has taken his own life. That he spoke this thing. By God's life, in other words, again. Who has put me in place and sat me on the, the throne of my father, and has made for me a dynasty, like he said. Today, Adoniyahu is going to die. And 
And he sends Nayao ben Yoyada. Now, Nayao ben Yoyada is a Kohen, by the way. He was responsible for the elite forces, the crates. <coughs> we heard about this at the end of Perak Aleph. He sends him and he, and he kills Adoniyahu. If you think about it for a moment, and you think about the three sons now that David Amelech has lost, two have been unfortunately killed from fratricide, right? Shlomo kills Adoniyahu. Avshalom kills Amnon. Avshalom is murdered by Yoav. This is a, a tragic family that occurs. And this is something else that sometimes we find in monarchies, even in the Jewish world, that to be able to maintain that monarchy, monarchy there's a tremendous price that's associated with it. Yeah, Yafa. Is, is there um, some significance in the fact that Benyahu is a Kohen? Um, he was, there is questions about how Benyahu could do such as a Kohen. Right. But we've already seen in the previous parak and before that Benyahu was over the Kratim Beit. So Kohanim went to war and Kohanim would fight. Where the question comes up among Chazal, was Benayahu really the one who killed him or did Benayahu assign someone else? And the mm. question is, would he be metame himself for this? Mm. However, a coin's allowed to do this if this mm -hmm. is the halach of what has to happen. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that question of Chazal back and forth, what, what really happened here if Benayahu was the one who just ordered the, the execution or executed him. Now he was executed as a moreid b'malchut. This was legal, as, as horrific as it is, it's legal. And he wasn't, if you remember, Adoniyahu wasn't on David HaMelech's list. David HaMelech didn't put, take care of Adoniyahu. And it could be as simple as the fact that David HaMelech had seen enough of his sons murdered. And he just didn't want to think about anything else. And at this point, Adoniyahu was in a self-imposed um, lockdown or stay in place. And uh, he violated that stay in place by going to Bathsheba. So that's number one. That's a simple act of rebelliousness. And then, the and then what he's requesting is a clear action of absolute rebelliousness. Now there's one other person he has to take care of right now, and that's Evyatara. Evyatara Kohen, if you recall, was the Kohen Gadol who had actually participated in Adoniyahu's, um, Adoniyahu's uh, um, anoint, anointment. He was a direct descendant of Elia Kohen. He tells him, to Eviatar, he says, look, go to Anatot. Anatot's about three and a half kilometers uh, north of Yerushalayim. There's an Arab village by the almost the exact same name that's there. Lecha Sadecha, go to your fields. Ki ish mavetata because you really are deserving a death penalty. I'm not going to, however, kill you on this day. And the reason I'm not going to kill you on this day, because you have borne the Aron. You have been one of the carriers of the Aron. Now, interestingly, it's hard to find that he actually carried the Aron. Chazal talk about the fact that he brought the Aphod. He was, a Yatar, if you remember, was the last of the surviving Kohanim in Nov. Back when Shaul had massacred the city of Nov, Ev Yatar was the one king, was the one Kohen who survived and told David about that action. David had taken him in. Now, the murder of Kohane Nov, if you recall, David Hamelech had taken very personally. He felt it was his fault because he had appeared there and he was seen there, and therefore Shaul did what he did to the Kohanim of Nov. And Eviatar was brought close to him. Eviatar brought with him the ephod, the ephod, the breastplate. That ephod is also referred to as an Aron elsewhere, and it could very likely be that when we're talking about you're the one who did this at the time of Kwane No, David had a very soft spot for Eviatar, and it could also be the reason why Shlomo didn't view him as the same kind of threat. He ultimately was a religious leader, but we don't see him taking part in military leads. He did the mistake with the, with the attempted you know, with, with the anointing of, um, of Adoniyahu, but we don't see elsewhere. And so Shlomo seems to give him off that, that possibility. And and also you have been part of those things that my father suffered through. You were with my father through all of this time. You've suffered along with him. The Radak says specifically, this is referring to 
the Kohen Nov, that he was the one surviving Kohen from Nov, you did, you, you, you made a terrible mistake with, with Adoniyahu, but it's not one that I'm going to kill you over. And he stops being a coin for God. A coin is literally a server. A coin doesn't mean kon. A coin means one who serves. Okay, so you can have kohanim who are people who are not even kohanim sometimes. And by doing this, he is fulfilling that which had been told to the house of Eli more than a hundred years earlier. You remember, Eli was told that the the, the Kuhuna was going to be torn away from him. This was at the same time that Shmuel was rising up on the scene. Eli was Shmuel's Rebbe. Uh, he was told he was going to lose it all. Eli dies. Shmuel comes on the scene. Shaul reigns. David Amelech reigns. So this is a hundred years ago. We've been told that Beit Eli was no longer going to be the, the dynasty of the Kohanim Gedolim, and that happens. Yoav hears what's going on. Now, that very simply, what, he, what did Yoav hear? Yoav hears that David says, get rid of him. It could, uh, it, it could be very simply, by the way, that Yoav hears all the things that, Shmuel, that, uh, that Shlomo is doing as well. He's seeing all of these things. He sees Adoniyahu's downfall. Ki Yoav natachre Adoniyahu. Yoav followed Adoniyahu. He didn't follow Avshalom. And so what he does is he seeks sanctuary. And he seeks sanctuary in the sanctuary into the Mishkan. He grabs onto the corners of the Mizbeach. If you remember in the ancient world, and especially with us, the Mizbeach had on each four corner, it had posts that were standing up. Those are the Karnot, the horns of the Mizbeach itself. He grabs onto them feeling that he's going to be saved. And it's told to him that he ran there. Okay. This already is an act as well, an element of rebellion. He's trying to work around the king. And now he sends Benayahu again, and he says, kill him. Now, interestingly, there's a number of discussions among Chazal why didn't the Mizbeach offer him the sanctuary? The Malbim offers a very simple answer, that the only time a Mizbeach would offer sanctuary is the Beit HaMikdash. The Beit HaMikdash is yet to be built. There is still nothing, okay? There's still nothing there yet. It's a possibility as um, even then, he would have to be on top of the Mizbeach if it wasn't the time of, of the Beit HaMikdash. Another possibility is the kind of, of what does it save a person from? Does it save a person from even being a rebellious person or not? But David HaMelech says, kill him. And so Benayahu comes forth and he says, listen, get out. Now, interestingly, the Abarbanel says, when he says to him, say, he isn't just saying get out of the sanctuary because it doesn't seem to make sense. He thinks he's protecting himself in the sanctuary. So just because Benayahu says, hey, stop protecting yourself, he'll stop. The answer is, according to the, according to the Abar Benel, he's actually saying, get out of here and go talk to the king. See, beg him for mercy. Now, interestingly, the other piece of the puzzle, the Malbim says, no. The reason he ran there was not just to save his life. Who normally would be there in the area of the Aron, in the area of everything else, is the Sanhedrin. So the Rishalmi, the Gemara in the Rishalmi says, hey, Yoav knew he was dead. There was no question in his mind he was going to get killed. The only question is, is he going to be killed as a moreg b'malchut, as a person who rebels against the king, or is he going to be killed via the Sanhedrin? Now, the difference between the two is if the Sanhedrin, who typically would, would sit in the area of the Beit HaMikdash, once the Beit HaMikdash would be built, it was the Lishkata Gazit, which is to the, uh, the right side of the Beit HaMikdash, where they would sit. If you're killed by the Sanhedrin, it's a regular uh, death penalty, regular death penalty. All of your assets go to your children. If you're killed by the king for having been rebellious, your assets go to the king. And so according to the Malbin, he knew he was dead, but he wanted to choose the kind of death he would get to at least help out his family. So 
But Benayahu says to him, say, my Yomelo, keep poamut. He says, no, I'm going to die here. Vayashav Benayahu et ha-melech devar, lemor koti ber Yoav v'chohanani. And so Benayahu ben Yoyada goes back to Gavad ha-melech. This is strange. There was a success. The sense of sanctuary, and he says, "Listen, this is what I told him. This is what he answered." Go ahead, kill him, and then bury him. And you will now remove all of the innocent blood from my level of responsibility. The interesting thing here is. The David Amelech has no hesitation, and Shlomo Amelech has no hesitation in doing what needs to be done. Everyone else is around, and there's this weakness, there's this doubt. The Nayao says, How can you kill a person inside the area that would be, will be the Beit HaMikdash, the area where there is a Mizbeach, the area where the Aron is located? Shlomo has no doubt at all about it. But what he does say is bury him. Now, bury him, the Radak says, give him the honor at least of being buried in his ancestral burial place. The um, the uh, the Embarbanel says bury him in a place of, of honor, but kill him, get him out of the way, and he'll remove this way all of these sins because ultimately, all of the people he had killed were killed without warning, were killed in an extra legal manner that were illegitimate. They were, as I mentioned before, all talked about the Mei okay, that or the Mei b'Shalom that he did things that may have been permitted in time of war, but it wasn't war at the time he did it. And that again is the Bible emphasizes it as well. Um, Shlomo says, let's remember. You got to remember who you're dealing with. You're dealing with a person who went ahead and killed two innocents who were greater than him. My father didn't know anything about it. He was a Moreb Malchut at the time of my father. These people, those murders must have weighed tremendously on David Amalek's mind, but also on Shlomo's. They, they were, you know, they, these were real uh, scandals that had occurred at the time, and Yoab did it. All of their sins will go on to the head of Yoav. And it will be the responsibility of his family forever. And for us, David and everyone else, will be fine. In other words, this is, has to happen. Benayahu kills Yoav. And he was buried by Midbar. Now, interestingly, the problem is if he's buried by Midbar, a Midbar normally means wilderness. So Rashi actually says by Midbar, meaning that he was buried and all of his assets, everything was considered hefker. Everything was just gone. Everything was, he lost everything. That's the by Midbar, not the location, but the death caused this Midbar. However, the simple piece must be that he was buried, uh, the simple way of explaining it, if, if we say he was supposed to be buried in an appropriate place, well, the appropriate place was outside the city. So he was buried outside in the Midbar. And so David HaMelech goes ahead, and now he places B'nayahu ben Yoyada to be over the army, that Sadok HaKohen Natan HaMelech Tachat Yatar. And Sadok is now elevated to be the Kohen Gadol in place of Eviatar. Now comes Shini ben Gela. And he tells Shini, Build for yourself a house in Yerushalayim. Now, why? According to Rashi, Shlomo still didn't want to cut off all relationship with him. He wanted him there. According to the Abar Benel, the Abar Benel has presents a very Machiavellian approach. You keep your enemies closest. Of all the enemies that are alive, this one is the most threatening, according to the Abar Benel. And therefore, he wants to keep them there. And he tells them, as a result, build yourself a house where you be a shop to shop and live there. Velo teitze misham anav anav. Don't go out. Okay, again. Stay in place order. 
והיה ביום צאתך, ועברת את נחל קדרון, and if you cross and you go out via the Nachal Kidron, Nachal Kidron, if you remember, between Ir David and Har Azetim, that's where it goes down. Okay. If you leave, you go beyond your house, you can walk around the block. But if you go beyond the house, know that you're going to die. Ayomer Shimi. And by the way, I just point one thing out, the Malbin points out it's important. If you remember, Shimon ben Gamaliel was from the town of Bachurim. The town of Bachurim is, to, is in that direction, on the other side of Nachal Kidron. So he said, you can't go home, in essence. Vayomer Shimi, the Melech, Tov HaDavar Kasher Giber Adoni HaMelech, fine, says Shimi. Ken Ya'asav, I'm going to follow your rules. Vayeshev, Vayeshev Shimi B'Yerushalayim Yamim Rabim, and Shimi lived there for a long time. But three years later, three of his servants ran away. They ran to the west, to the city of Gat, to the king. And they told Shimi, your servants are in Gat. Shimi gets up, he um, saddles his donkey, Vayelach Gata El Achish, and he goes to Achish in Gat, Levakeshet Avadav, Vayelach Shimi Viyavet Avadav Migat. He goes and he brings him back. Now it's interesting, when he goes there, remember, he's going to Gat, that's the Philistines, the enemy. He goes, to, it, the king of the Philistines is part of this picture. On a simple level, we know, uh oh, he's violating Shlomo's rule of going out. But if you look at how he violates it, with whom he violates it, it's not a simple violation. He's violating it big time. He's going to the enemy. And it's told to Shlomo, he left and he came back. And he calls Shimi. Didn't I swear with you? Okay. Didn't I go ahead and say this is when I tell you something, a king's word says the Radak is like a Shuah. I said, I'm gonna kill you. He said, I heard it. Why didn't you listen? You know really all the evil that you have done for my father. God is going to return this evil to you. The king Shlomo is blessed and the, the throne of David will be established forever. And here comes Ben Ayao Ben Yoyada again. And he kills Shimi ben Geram, the Hamam Lachan Nechona Biyad Shlomo. And all of this, why do we have to say that the monarchy was, was established? Because at this point, there's no punishment for any of this. HaKodesh Borchus says, Rashi, this was all justified. What had to happen? Each of the cases, and so Shlomo is not held responsible for these deaths. Notice who is the executioner in each, the head of the army. Notice how it's managed and how the fulfillment of David Amelech's commands. We're going to stop right here. Next week, we'll pick up the same time, same place. You can let other people know if you want. We're happy to invite newbies to the shear. If you know people who normally come but weren't on today, I would ask if you could please let them know. They can also call in. There's a call-in number if they're not that good computers. And for those of you who don't have computer uh, uh, cameras or have, you can always get a computer camera on Amazon, they're still delivering. Have a very good day. By the way, at 11 o'clock, by the way, at 11 o'clock, if you want, there's a Pesach seminar, but it's more for people who haven't done it in a while. I have a feeling all of us have done it very well. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I have a question. Oh, shows, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to be working at 11.